Welcome to the webinar, Meshing Specialized Equipment Funding and Services for Students, an Ontario model. This webinar is hosted by the Network of Assistive Technologists on this Friday, the 18th of June, 2021. Today, we are joined by a trio of occupational therapists, Linda Petty, working in private practice, Lorna Lowe from the Vision Technology Services at OCAD University, and Catherine Benoit from the University of Waterloo Center for Sight Enhancement. So welcome, Linda, Lorna, and Catherine, and thank you, each of you, for joining us today. And with that said, I'll now hand over the screen sharing as you guys begin today's presentation. All right, you guys there, see ya. Thank you, Doug, for the welcome. So I'm Linda Petty. I'm going to start the show. And the three of us have all been involved with the assistive devices program, as well as working with students within the higher ed area. And we really felt this was an important topic to be discussed because we've had a lot of great input from ADP vendors, the people that sell the equipment that is funded through the assistive devices program, but not a lot of input as to what services are available through the assistive devices program centers, and also what funding is available, and in particular, the, the really fuzzy area of how it works with educational funding. So that's our goal today. Lorna, do you want to move on? That's our objective then. We want to talk about how assistive technology services available through the Ministry of Health can work with the bursary for students with disabilities, which is Ontario's funding for technology at the higher education level. And in particular, we're going to focus on the visual aids branch of the assistive devices program, because that's, again, something we've had a lot of input on recently, which has been great. But it's one thing to go into depth on braille displays, for example, but another thing to figure out who pays for that and how. So to give you an overview of the vision services that are out there, the referral assessment process, and we're going to add some student case presentations, have some discussion at that point, if people want to um, chip in or ask questions and so on. And then hopefully, <clears throat> if we've timed this all right, we'll end with time for questions again. So thank you for joining us. So the Canadian government, as we know, healthcare is funded by the federal government, but it's administered by provincial governments. And every province is different as to how much they fund equipment and technology and aids. So some places there is little and no fund or no funding, whether you need a, a manual wheelchair or something very advanced and expensive. And sometimes there's funding for some groups like school age children. Um, and in some provinces, there's extensive funding for all ages. So Ontario is one of the have provinces. We, the assistive devices program was launched by the Ministry of Health in the late eighties and is an amazing program for what it does fund. They do remind us, um, so I am an authorizer for about four different categories within that, and you get reminded regularly that it's not a legislated program, meaning there's nothing in the Ontario law that says the Ministry of Health has to fund this. On the other hand, they've been amazingly consistent at funding equipment for people of all ages, and it's not means tested. So we're fortunate and we're glad to be um, able to access this funding. 
So the goal is supporting people with long-term disabilities, so greater than six months. So not if you have cancer and you need a wheelchair for home for short term, for example. There's 11 different categories. They fund a range of things. What we're going to focus on today, we'll just briefly review mobility aids, hearing aids, communication aids for both speech and written, and visual aids, as that I think has the biggest overlap with education higher ed. Equipment covers sensory and physical disability people with sensory or physical disabilities. So they're very specific that if you have a sole diagnosis of ADHD or a learning disability, you are not covered. Um, you do have to have um, medical confirmation and there, you have to go through a registered authorizer who determines your functional el eligibility. And then again, the program is set up so that most of the time it's registered vendors who provide this and then the government reimburses the vendors. We'll talk about exceptions to that as we go, okay? So the, what's lovely is that it's consumer-centered support and funding to Ontario residents and it's to give them personalized assistive devices appropriate for the individual's basic needs. And again, it's round in that it's not the Cadillac, it's basic needs. On the other hand, the devices that are covered are really meant to increase people's independence, give them access to equipment that meets their individual needs and enable them to live independently in the community for the most part or in um, a facility, an institution. So it's not for equipment that is primarily for use in education or the workplace. So if somebody needs a braille display to work at the Bank of Montreal, ADP is not going to cover that. So in the same way, educational environment, this is where the funding issues become problematic when it comes to something needed only for school, okay? So starting with mobility aids, because this is a difficult category when you're talking about school needs. So again, basic mobility requirements, but you can get up to 75% funding for the costs of walkers, wheelchairs, scooters, power chairs, and seating. And again, it has to work within the individual's place of residence and again, entry exit from their place of residence. So someone who wants a scooter, but lives in an inaccessible house, would not be eligible for that scooter because it doesn't help them access their home. On the other hand, someone else who's in a long-term care facility needs to move around within the facility as well as access their own unit within the building might well be eligible. And it's also not to be a, for a taxi or a bus or a car. The other big area is it's not, the individual wouldn't be eligible if it was solely for work, school, sports, recreation, exercise, or therapy. So those amazing chairs that are used in wheelchair basketball and other wheelchair sports are not funded through ADP. So it's, I have hit this personally where one of our students used um, forearm crutches and braces for walking on campus. And that was fine within our high school environment. But the U of T Scarborough campus where I was working is very spread out. And literally the student was picking her courses because she needed an hour between classes to get from A to B. And in the winter, she was at high risk of falls because if one of her crutches um, tips hit some ice, she would go flying. But her home was not accessible. It was a multi-story townhouse and she could not drive within her townhouse. So she wasn't eligible for ADP funding for a scooter, for example, which would have met her needs nicely 
on campus. One option with that is if the student lives on campus in an accessible residence, for example, then they would be eligible potentially for funding. But again, only if they were eligible in the time period, ADP generally funds things with a five-year window. So in mobility, it would be five years before you'd be eligible for a new scooter or a new power chair if your old one isn't working. So again, these are all factors to take into consideration when you're looking at your student and how are they gonna access the campus, okay? So the, another tricky area is hearing technology. So the audiologist in this case is both the authorizer and the vendor and does the application for that 75% funding for hearing aids, FM systems, cochlear implants, and more. Um, the issue being a lot of first year students have just turned 18 or 19, and you have to make sure that they have transitioned from the pediatric program into the adult program for those hearing devices and that they get appropriate equipment before first term. I've been working with students who, you know, September comes and they're still on a waiting list trying to be seen by Sunnybrook so that they can get the equipment to be able to um, use on campus. So in that case too, the bursary, for example, or the educational institution might bet be then the one that covers the cost of additional equipment needed on campus. So classroom transmitters, for example, and um, other technology that enables that student and possibly quite a range of other individuals to hear the lectures and follow along. All right, Marna. Hi, everybody. So just before I continue with the ADP categories that Linda started, um, just a little bit about myself. So last year, I was in the um, assistive technology consultant role at University of Toronto at the Scarborough campus in the accessibility office. I'm also an ADP authorizer for um, two categories of ADP equipment under visual aids and communication aids. Right now, my main role is at OCAD University's uh, Vision Technology Service, where I assess and authorize funding for visual aids. I also have many years of experience in, in the communication aids clinics in our province and continue to work with both equipment categories to integra integrate the funding and services. So this slide just shows um, a picture of our signature OCAD building. It's a black and white tabletop structure sitting on these colorful stilts except I'm not in that building, but in this very plain looking brick building pictured below. Um, but this doesn't really matter where I am right now because we're all still working remotely. So communication aids funded by ADP overlaps with assistive technology used and funded for students in post-secondary education. ADP provides funding for communication aids for students who have a long-term physical disability that affects their ability to communicate verbally and through written communication. Um, so like other categories of ADP funding, there is an approved list of equipment and ADP provides 75% funding. So ADP divides communication aids into two groups. The first group is equipment used to enhance or replace verbal or face-to-face -face communication. And this includes devices such as voice prosthesis and voice amplifiers that are worn by the person to enhance sound. There are also low-tech options like communication displays, which are custom collections of pictures and words that are created specifically for the user to communicate by pointing or looking at a desired target. And then we have more high tech speech generating devices where text and symbols are converted to speech. If you caught last week's note webinar, um, you would have seen the Toby eye gaze with AAC software, which is an example of equipment that's funded. The second group of equipment is to enhance or replace written communication. This includes computer systems, hardware, like alternative keyboards and mice, head controlled and eye gaze devices and all kinds of switches. Software also includes things like speech recognition, word prediction and Curzo 3000. 
And then commercial and custom mounting equipment is also funded and they support physical access to the device by positioning it, positioning it to the person, um, whether they're working at a desk or from a wheelchair or in bed. So eligibility of funding is determined by authorizers in designated multidisciplinary settings known as AAC clinics. And these clinics provide service to specific populations, might be based on age or diagnosis. Um, I think, and people can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think all clinics are hospital-based and they often, um, because they're in a hospital, they may have access to wheelchair or seating clinics as well that they can consult with and collaborate with the AAC clinic. Some AAC clinics work within specialty high-tech clinics that also include wheelchair clinics, other healthcare professionals, and medical specialists, just so that the person can receive care for all their complex needs. And AAC clinics can be vendors as well, and this is common for clinics outside of the Toronto area where there might be limited ADP vendor options. And ADP funded equipment may be purchased from those registered vendors. Um, so there's vendors, um, there's one microassistive tech in Mississauga, which you might be familiar with. Um, there's also another vendor option for people receiving ADP funding um, called a centralized equipment pool or SEP, which serves all of Ontario. And SEP was created to provide ADP applicants an affordable way of getting expensive equipment through a leasing and purchasing options. And the program also maintains a pool of equipment that is shared and recycled to keep costs down. And SEP also serves as a resource and provides training to all clinicians working in the area of AAC. So like Linda said, visual aids is what is the common connection between the three of us here today. Um, so under the assistive devices program, students that are Ontario residents with low vision and vision loss are eligible for this funding. And ADP funded visual aids include low tech and high tech devices. And like all ADP categories, ADP has a list of approved equipment with set amounts and students receive up to 75% funding for that set maximum. And ADP eligibility is determined by assessment with designated authorizers and at designated clinics. So there's three criteria that the student needs to meet for ADP eligibility. First, um, there needs to be a medical reason. So ADP requires a medical diagnosis that impacts visual function, which is measured by the person's best corrected visual acuity. And ADP gives an example of 20 over 70 as someone who may be eligible. It's, it's important to note that the 20 over 70 is not a hard criteria, but it is the number that is clinically used to classify someone as having low vision. So when someone has 20 over 70 vision, it means that he or she must be at 20 feet to see something that a person with normal vision can see at 70 feet. And some optometrists view 20 over 50 as low vision because this is when daily function is impaired. In Ontario, optometrists are required to report drivers with uh, best corrected visual acuity of 2050 or worse. And your visual acuity is one measure of vision and it's not the most comprehensive indicator of visual function. Visual acuity doesn't provide information about processing issues, binocular function or contrast issues, which has one of the biggest impacts on daily function. The second criteria depends what the equipment will be used for. So ADP will fund equipment for the purposes of everyday viewing in your surroundings, for reading, for writing, and for orientation and mobility. And the third reason is based on the student's function. And this is where the authorizer's assessment is crucial in determining how visual impairment impacts the student's ability to function and participate in daily tasks. So under visual aids, there are three types of authorizers which correspond to the type of equipment that they are permitted to authorize. So orientation and mobility specialists um, assess and train and authorize funding for white canes. Low vision optometrists are optometrists that specialize in low vision and they provide a more in-depth assessment um, beyond your standard visual assessment. They can also become authorizers for low tech aids or um, optical aids that support viewing at those different distances. And then clinicians at regional assessment centers or also called RACs, 
Um, we assess and authorize low-tech and high-tech aids that support personal and school-related reading and writing needs. And authorizers at RACS may be OTs, uh, technologists, or technologists with lived experiences. So this is a list of the regional assessment centers in Ontario, and they do tend to be concentrated in the southern part of the province. Um, Catherine's going to speak a little bit more about the clinic at University of Waterloo. Uh, there's also Vision Loss Rehab Ontario, which was formed after they separated from CNIB a few years ago. So the former CNIB tech clinics are now part of VLRO, and they have a few clinics across various Ontario cities. And some have satellite clinics that venture out further, but they may have limitations in terms of what they can authorize. In Toronto, there's also the Vision Institute that only authorizes CCTVs. And then there's W. Ross McDonald School, which is the school for the blind. Um, they are operated by the Ministry of Education and they only assess and authorize equipment for students who have complete uh, vision loss. And then there's me at Vision Technology Services at OCAD. So we're a really small community. Uh, we often consult with each other. We refer to each other if we feel a student's needs are better met uh, somewhere else. So a little bit more about um, our service, vision technology service. So we offer two types of assessment for people with low vision. Uh, most of the assessments that we do are for ADP funding. There is a fee for the assessment, which is funded by ADP. So the student cost ends up being uh, $100, but this is completely covered if they receive social assistance. And Vision Technology Services was originally created to support clients with low vision and physical impairments. Our clinic not only has visual aids for assessment, but also a range of assistive technology, including computer access equipment, communication devices, and software to work with uh, the AAC clinics. We also provide employee accommodation service, and this is a fee for service assessment. It's paid for by employers to determine workplace accommodations for employees with, vis with visual and or physical uh, needs. So as an occupational therapist, our high tech assessment for visual aids is uh, goal oriented, it's client centered, it's a very comprehensive functional assessment. We use the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure, which is an evidence-based outcome measure to determine changes in function. And the assessment looks at the person, which includes taking a full medical history of the student, evaluating their physical, sensory, cognitive, and mental abilities. We also capture a full visual history, including visual processing issues, changes or fluctuations in their vision, um, any visual sensitivities they may be experiencing, strain or fatigue. And functional vision for reading and writing is also evaluated under uh, different lighting conditions, different contrasts, different color sizes, and how it impacts the student's reading fluency and comprehension. Equipment is also considered in the context of changing needs. So whether um, school demands are evolving or if there are variations in the person's health or their function. And understanding the student's equipment preference and experience is really important. Um, why is a student choosing a particular software over another? What piece of equipment did not work for them and why? Also determining what other devices are being used iPad and smartphones, although they're great devices, they may lack the full features needed for the demands of post-secondary education. We also want to know what other technology um, the person's using, communication aids, hearing aids, wheelchairs, um, as this may impact um, how they're using their equipment and also to explore if they can or should be integrated. And as assessors, we also consider all the different places that the client is using their high-tech aids and how, they, and how it can affect their function. Is there support for successful use of the device in the different environments? Does the student have adequate funding? Are they aware of disability services in their school? Sometimes I'm redirecting students to contact the disability office for support. And as OTs, we are interested in all the daily activities that the student participates in, not just the ADP designated funding reasons. So understanding how the student uses their equipment across different roles and activities beyond those that the, the funding was intended for often uncovers hidden barriers and potential solutions. 
And we also want the student to be making an informed choice of their assistive technology. So an assessment at a high tech visual aids clinic allows the student to trial a range of different equipment, weigh out features and costs so that they can make the best decision. So although funding systems may be separated by our respective government ministries and even by the different um, ADP categories, the person is not. So our high tech visual aids assessment is really evaluating all the students needs, which fits into ADP criteria, uh, which does not, so that we can determine if other equipment, other service providers and other funding can be integrated to best meet the students needs. And this means consulting and working with all of you in um, post-secondary education settings. So once the assessment is completed and equipment is finalized, the authorizer completes the ADP application form. And the applicant then chooses a vendor to purchase the equipment. And ADP is very strict about staying within those funding limits. So receipts for equipment purchase must be within those ADP uh, maximum limits, otherwise funding can be denied. And that means that students cannot top up their ADP funding like they can with uh, the BSWD. Students have the choice of purchasing computer equipment from an ADP registered vendor, which is a store that is authorized to handle and submit ADP applications, or they can also purchase from a non-registered vendor, which is just a, a regular computer store. Um, assistive technology, though, on the other hand, those all have to be purchased from an ADP registered vendor. Some ADP vendors are registered to only sell visual aids, and some are only, only registered to sell communication aids. Some sell both, and some may only sell select equipment within that particular category. So when purchasing from an ADP vendor, um, the students only have to pay for their portion. But if a student purchases from a regular computer store, the student pays for the entire amount up front and then re is reimbursed by ADP uh, after one month. So obtaining equipment through ADP funding may take several months um, as it takes eight to 12 weeks for approval to be received through ADP, um, but there are no school term based deadlines so applications can be sent in at any time. So if you think students are eligible for assistive technology through ADP, um, get them in earlier so that funding can be authorized. Usually wait lists for visual aids are not too bad, um, maybe a month, but communication aids clinics tend to have a slightly longer wait lists. So this takes care of all the um, ADP procedural stuff. I'm gonna let Catherine introduce herself and she'll tell you a little bit more about the equipment that's funded through ADP. Thank you, Lorna. So I'm Catherine, I'm an occupational therapist and my role is at the Center for Sight Enhancement. Next slide. Perfect. So the Center for Sight Enhancement is out of the University of Waterloo, and we provide a number of different services, um, a primary one being the low vision assessment. So that's completed by a low vision optometrist. It's different from a regular eye exam. The low vision assessment is focused on making the most out of the vision that someone has. So it's very function based. We have counseling services as well. Um, we have a low vision therapist who really works um, in coordination with the low vision optometrist to help fine tune um, some of the prescriptions or the tints. Uh, they might talk about activities of daily living, such as putting on your makeup or going grocery shopping or making a recipe and different low tech devices that are funded. Um, CCTV assessments, computer assessments. So that's my role at the Center for Sight Enhancement is looking at the high tech computer side of things. Um, prior to COVID, I was doing home visits as well. And I'm excited to get back to those as soon as possible, but those are still on hold. And uh, fortunately we are able to do remote assessments because traveling to the clinic can be difficult for people um, who often don't drive. So remote assessments are a great option there. Um, of course we do funding through the ADP program. 
And we have some other services as well. So um, contact lens, getting your glasses, binocular vision, primary care, vision therapy. These are all some of the um, some other services the university provides for clients as needed. So to talk a little bit about some of the devices that ADP funds, um, first is orientation and mobility aids. So this would be a cane. Maybe it's to help them navigate their environment. Maybe it's just to help other people um, become aware that this individual has vision loss. Uh, so that would be funded by an orientation and mobility uh, specialist. And generally funding for that is every year. Uh, then we have the, so during a low vision exam, they might be shown some of these devices and then the low vision therapist would then fine tune everything. So these are the low tech aids and oftentimes they could help with near vision, intermediate or distance vision. They might be wearable devices or magnifiers. So we have some examples on this screen. So this lady in the top left corner, she has tinted lenses on and those might help to minimize glare. They might help with minimizing the light if someone has a lot of light sensitivity or photophobia. They can help with that. They might help improve contrast. Um, so a pair of, a regular pair of glasses, if you wear them, you know they're not funded, but if the glasses have something specific to their health and like to their vision that's making it better, it might be funded through ADP. Um, the photo next to them, to the, to the right, we have a little girl there holding a monocular. So this might be used for distance. We had a gentleman um, who was into curling and needed something to see the end of the curling rink. So this was a device that he chose for him and it's small, it's discreet, can fit in your pocket, it's lightweight. And then he could use it just to see the end of the rink. Maybe you're using it to read the street sign. Um, and those could be monoculars. You have some that are more telescopes or binoculars, so you have two, uh, two. And then below that, we have a picture of an illuminated handheld magnifier. So this is a device that you could use for a bunch of different things um, in the grocery store, reading the name of a product or reading the price tag on a piece of clothing, reading your mail. Yeah. So. For these devices, they're often funded between one, three, or five years, depends on the device. And it doesn't have to be one intermediate, one near, one far. It can be any combination, um, but it can't be the same device. So you can't get funding for the same device twice. It just has to be different. So next we have, we're gonna talk about some reading aids and ADP has two different high-tech categories, reading and writing. Of course, when the client's using these devices, they're going to be using it in very multi-purpose ways, but these categories are just there. So ADP has policies and procedures about how the equipment is being funded. So clients are allowed one high-tech reading device and one high-tech writing device every five years. So one common reading device or reading aid is called a CCTV. So that is a camera attached to a screen. You can put a piece of paper or a product under there and then it'll show up on the screen where you can then zoom in, you can change the color or you can add a visual marker such as a red line to help keep your place on the screen. These come in different sizes, so it could be a desktop where it stays in one spot and you might have a workstation set up, or it could be portable so it would fit into a backpack. These are on a lease to own program, and that's funded through CPAC. Um, so CPAC stands for Site Enhancement. Because it's a CCTV and you're magnifying the information, people do have to have some degree of vision for this to be a um, functional device for them. So site enhancement, equipment pool, and assessment center. So they manage the CCTV lease program, which is five years. 
So when someone purchases a CCTV, it doesn't belong to them. It belongs to this program for five years. After the five years, then it's theirs. So it comes in within that five year lease period, it does come with a full warranty. So if the CCTV were to break, um, you can then return it and it will be repaired and sent back to you. Um, and there's a few different options for the purchase. So the first one would be to get a new CCTV. So you come in, you compare all of the CCTVs, you identify the one that would best meet your needs. And then the cost for that is about $600 for the client portion. Generally, CCTVs are anywhere from 14 to 1600. So a cost of $600 is a significantly reduced cost, although it is still a significant cost. Um, so for that reason, sometimes people might choose a recycled CCTV. So think about, you know, you went into Best Buy, you bought a computer, and you returned it within the warranty time, and then Best Buy checks it over and sells that to someone else. So that's what the recycled CCTV portion is doing. Someone had got a CCTV, maybe their vision changed so it's not helpful, maybe they're moving out of the province so they can't take it with them, maybe they're moving into a different environment where they no longer have the space or it's not, they don't need it. Um, so then they would return it if it's in within that five-year warranty. And then those are checked out and then given to people off of the wait list for a cost of $200. So significantly reduced cost uh, for a recycled unit, still has the full five-year warranty. So if something were to break or happen to the CCTV, it will be repaired or replaced. There is a third option here, which is the surplus option. So listen closely. If you have clients that maybe aren't eligible, for ADP funding because they don't meet the criteria. Maybe they already have a CCTV, but they want a second one for the cottage, or they want a second one for the workplace. Um, or maybe you're just working at an educational environment or a, at a workplace and you think, oh, maybe it would be helpful to put a CCTV in the student lounge or at the public library. Um, you could opt for a surplus model. So I think of this as a blowout sale, um, just an older model. It's once you purchase it, it is yours. So there's really no refund on that. Um, the 30 day warranty is really only to cover shipping costs to make sure it gets to you and it's working. But the cost for that is a flat $250 fee. If you're interested in a surplus model, um, talk to your local CNIB. You do want to be assessed because you want to make sure that it is the right fit for you um, or for your organization. So some additional reading aids here. The neat thing about the items on this screen is that they would go for, um, they fit across the vision spectrum. So from site substitution to site enhancement, these are devices that would um, potentially uh, be a good fit for you. So we have audio players um, at the very top left, we have the Victor, um, the Victor readers, stream. And then below that, we have the Victor Reader Stratus. Um, and these are just um, devices that play audiobooks. The bottom one is a little bit bigger because you can put a whole CD in there. So oftentimes people might like that because it mimics as a regular CD player that they're used to using. Um, the smaller one, you can put an SD card in that. You could stream books from the web. Um, there's also Kurzweil 1000. So this is a OCR software. Um, OCR stands for Optical Character Recognition. So that's the magic that turns a picture of text into actual text um, that can be listened to out loud, can be manipulated, can be enlarged. You could change the contract or the um, contrast or colors, and that could um, go on to the computer. So you could have a, a letter in the mail, you could put that on, scan it, um, or an article or a note from a classmate. Um, or if you have a digital textbook, you could open that up in that software, listen to your textbook. 
The devices at the bottom, we have the Sarah CE on the left and the Clear Reader Plus on the right. These are also OCR soft uh, devices, but it's an actual device. So you would put the page or the book in front of it. It takes a picture and then it reads it out loud. Uh, and then there's scanners that do the same thing. And there's lots of other kind of mainstream things that do the same thing. So for example, audiobooks, there's Audible, that's a popular app um, for this OCR software. We have CNAI, uh, KNFB Reader, um, Adobe Scan. So lots of different apps you can have on your phone to just take a picture and then have it read out loud. So next we're gonna move into some of the writing aids. Um, so the, the primary system for a writing aid could be a laptop, tablet, or desktop, and it could be any operating system. Um, so again, here, um, even though ADP kind of has them exclusive, obviously a client might use their laptop to do some reading. Um, that's, that's great, obviously it's encouraged, but the reverse is not true. So I have had a client want a tablet just to read audiobooks um, or not listen to audiobooks or to you know read books, but since they're not using it for writing, it's not fundable. So although they could use it for more, I couldn't fund a tablet as just a reading aid because it does have to be funded as a writing aid. So sometimes that can be a limitation. Um, the big thing to note here are the funding limits. So as Lorna explained, these are maximum amounts. So if the cost is more than this, then it's not fundable. Uh, the client is not able to pay the difference. So if it's a laptop or tablet, the maximum it can cost is $12.50 before tax. We can add a monitor to that, um, but that's the only, uh, just the laptop or tablet, just the portable, we can add the monitor for $259 maximum. For the desktop system, it's $1350 maximum, and it's assumed that you're going to get a monitor um, with the desktop system all in one. Or for clients who are site substitution, they may not even um, choose to have a monitor if, um, if they don't need a lot of tech support from other, other people who might use the monitor for visual access. Um, the computer system would include a word processing, a keyboard, speakers, if it fits in within the funding amount. Cell phones are not funded as a writing device. Um, sometimes that's disappointing, even more so for our site substitution clients who would like a small portable device, like a, um, but then a tablet, they don't really benefit from a larger screen, so they would rather have a cell phone, um, but they're not funded. So with the computer, oftentimes we need to add an accessibility software uh, to make it more accessible and more user-friendly for the client. So these are some of the software, softwares we can add in with the computer, and that would be their writing system. So for screen magnification, Zoom Text and Supernova um, are ones that will help to make everything larger. We have screen reading programs such as JAWS, Dolphin Guide Connect, which Dolphin Guide Connect does do magnification as well. Uh, VoiceOver, which is already built into the Mac. And sometimes we're doing a combination of symptoms, so, or of, um, of software. So I had a client uh, who their vision was progressing, but they still have some vision, but they want to start learning more screen reading and kind of transitioning to that. So then we might do Zoom text and JAWS. Um, Dragon is fundable, but only, so Dragon would be a voice control over the computer, but it's only funded for those individuals who can't physically use a keyboard. Um, but in that case, we could do Dragon and JAWS and JSA as the link to have the programs work together. And we also have Braille devices that we can add. So the one exception to this, um, 
is the Perkins Brailler. So Perkins Brailler is actually funded as a low tech device. And this is significant because when it's funded as a low tech, you don't have to have um, a ton of knowledge about Braille in advance to be able to get that device funded. It can be funded as a learning tool. Um, Braille is so important because the client is then able to actually read and it's developing literacy skills. So Braille, Braille is very important for that reason. It's also important because with the um, audio, so having things read out loud. If you're in a classroom, you can't be listening to your computer and the teacher at the same time. So Braille is a nice discreet way to be able to take notes, not have others hear um, you know, what you're writing or what your computer is saying and to minimize those distractions as well. So you're not trying to listen to two things at once. Um, okay, so Perkins Brailler, that's a low tech, so it can be funded as a writing device, great for building that muscle, or um, as a learning tool, um, great for building muscle memory for Braille. Then we have the Braille refreshable displays, like in the top left and bottom right. Uh, these come in a bunch of different sizes. Um, you can take your notes on there. Some have uh, limited capacity to store certain notes. Um, in the device as well. Um, we have Braille embossers, so that would be a Braille printer or a Braille translation software you can add to the computer. And there's personal information managers as well. So that's the picture at the very bottom right, uh, sorry, bottom left. And that is an Android-based system. You can connect to the internet, you can download information onto that and stream, but it's not a full computer system. It does have a screen for those who um, might use uh, some vision uh, built in, but it's not used by everybody. Um, for the high-tech Braille devices, you do have to have adequate Braille skills already, so they're not funded as a learning tool. Um, so that can be a barrier for those learning Braille. They won't be eligible for a high-tech Braille device. And last, we have the user support training. So um, if we give you software or a device, we want to make sure that you're actually able to use this, you understand how to use it, because we wouldn't want you know, to fund it and then kind of sit in a closet because nobody taught them how to use it. So you can get 10 hours of training for a reading aid and then 10 hours of training for a writing aid. This is funded 75%. So the cost to the client is $10 per hour um, for 10 hours. So that would be a total of $100. But if you are receiving social assistance, then it would be funded 100%. The user support is authorized by the ADP authorizer, um, but it's provided by a registered vendor or the CNIB often does the user support training as well. And I will pass it off to Linda. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so what's important is when you read the manual that comes with the bursary, it distinctly says you have to access the assisted devices program funding before you access bursary funding, which is what we've been trying to emphasize as we go along, this sort of make sure that the student is well supported through both. So if the student has used ADP previously for a computer and is eligible for that writing aid funding for a laptop, then you coordinate with the clinic. They, the ADP clinic provides that funded laptop. And, you know, if they need a monitor to enhance their sight, use a large screen, you can do that as well. And similarly, if the student already owns screen reading, screen magnification software, then, but doesn't have a laptop for school or whatever, you can fund the laptop through the bursary, but then they can use their software license on the bursary funded laptop. The mobility aid, as I mentioned earlier, 
is tricky. So hopefully they've got a mobility aid that will also meet their needs on campus. Otherwise, there might need to be some additional funding through some mechanism. With the bursary, you're going to hit the bursary then for specific AT software for education, whether it's voice recognition, text to speech, whatever. And you're also going to fund additional components, carrying cases, portable CCTVs, maybe because ADP doesn't fund, um, they'll fund the big desktop CCTVs, but less so uh, options for the, the portable ones used by a student near to distance CCTVs. Talking graphing calculators are another thing that um, you would go to the bursary for funding. So it's important to know about what funding is available from where and for the student to be able to access both. There is also, uh, Lorna mentioned the communication aids clinic. There are individual authorizers for communication aids, meaning writing aids, meaning a laptop or tablet. So um, it is possible if you're an ADP, I'm an ADP authorizer, individual authorizer for communication aids, and I have authorized that funding for students, as well as bursary funding for things that complement that, for example. Next slide. So consider there is this whole range. It is not just the bursary, the bursary, the bursary. There are other sources, including community organizations, and if there is an employer involved, employers. So do be aware of what's out there. Next. So just trying to give you a couple of examples. Um, so we had a 19 year old male student who had no functional vision, entered first year with his ADP funded laptop. He had been really well supported through school, um, through his vision itinerant teachers and through ADP. So we had Kurzweil 1000, he used NVDA for a screen reader. He had a braille display expertise in LaTeX, he was taking computer science and majoring in physics. So a major user of technology to be uh, um, someone with no vision and taking physics and computer science. So with the bursary, we funded when he got to the point in his education of needing it, the talking graphing calculator and UTSC as a campus also purchased a picture in a flash tactile graphics maker so that we could make tactile representation of the diagrams that were used in the tutorials and so on. Um, we provided braille textbooks for subjects like math where you have to be able to feel where the, the various equation figures are and so on. And we purchased a braille display for exam use so that he could use our braille display when taking exams. We also consulted to the physics department on various eligibility or not, sorry, accessibility issues for the physics experiments and so on. But again, many of these young people are hard users of technology. That technology is just such a part of their life. It goes with them everywhere, usually in a backpack. So I think it was during second year or maybe even third that that student's laptop died and they weren't eligible for new ADP funding. So the bursary then funded a laptop for him um, as he was well, just kind of in the middle of his academic program. So I think that student was really well supported with the various funding programs and the various specialized services. Next. So his sister arrived shortly after uh, the next year or so, 18 year old, she had low vision, she still had some functional vision, was a Zoom text user, was taking economics related courses, had bought, had received ADP funding for her laptop. And so the BSWD funded text to speech software, a large monitor, for her use at home because unfortunately she hadn't got it with the laptop and her ADP authorizer 
wasn't okay with funding it after the fact. She was used to using the live scribe pen and notebooks from high school. So the bursary funded those and arranged for electronic textbooks, CCTV access in the exam room and the library. And then she was struggling with accessing her macroeconomics, microeconomics, where they were essentially um, doing this writing on the whiteboard thing or writing on the projection system. So if you see the CCTV on the left side of the monitor, that is a MagnaLink S, a really great portable near to distance CCTV. She was able to use that then through bursary funding and used it both as her portable CCTV, she would um, cart it to classes, set it up with her laptop and record the profs writing and talking. Um, and also use it for viewing her, her paper documents or anything else she wanted. She also loved that she could use it to put on makeup. So again, it's a whole person device and um, it's excellent because we were able to fund that through the bursary, whereas ADP doesn't fund or correct me if I'm wrong, Lorna and Catherine, but I don't think they fund the near to distance portable CCTVs. So again, with the flexibility that both of these pockets of funding provide, students can be really, really well supported. And so I'd encourage you to be aware of what's available through the ADP clinics, the ADP funding, and to work closely with them. Next. So any questions? Um, around the student things before I jump on or Lorna jumps in? I think there is a like one near to distance CCTV that they do fund, but it's not very portable because it's attached to a monitor. So it would be very yeah. difficult to bring. Yeah. Well, the that's the Acrobat, right? And, and that's not something, yes, you can take it to your cottage, but it's not a device you're going to haul around in your backpack from class to class. So one of these specialized ones, I think, is, is very effective. Also, the like the MagnaLink S, it records. So there's your note-taking solution, right? You're, you're recording your lecture. Probably you become the best friend of everybody in the class. So it's a, it's a really well-developed I um, device, in my opinion. So no questions, and we're already at 2.30. So Lorna, why don't you carry on? So I'm just going to finish up with um, just a few community resources related to low vision. Um, so Balance is a community support organization that's uh, focused in the Toronto area. There's also Canadian Council for the Blind, which is a Canada-wide organization. Uh, they run a lot of social programs, but they also have a very active um, tech interest group as well. And then, of course, there's CNIB, which includes the Smart Life stores, and that is the uh, ADP registered vendor for visual aids. And then there's PAL, which is a volunteer organization that makes audio recordings of books um, by a human voice. And uh, these can be created and, and sent to students. And then there's uh, Vision Loss Rehab Ontario, which provides a range of vision rehabilitation services. Um, and they also do the ADP assessments for the visual aids as well. And then I mentioned earlier, um, W. Ross McDonald, which is the province's school for the blind, and they provide resources and supports to all the teachers in the province uh, in the education setting. So thanks for attending our session. Uh, we are here to answer any questions you may have. And if you don't have any questions now, please free to contact any one of us directly um, when, some, when something does come up. wonderful loads of information uh linda lorna and catherine it's uh, my head's uh, exploding here is is i guess the, the easiest way to say it um there's not been any uh, or very many questions come in as we've been doing the session but i do encourage people if there are questions that they um, add them in uh into the chat or unmute your microphone and we'll be able to call on you uh, and ask your question by voice and it looks like Mark has unmuted. So Mark, go ahead with your question.
Are you there, Mark? No, maybe, maybe Mark's uh, unmuted, just, uh, just unmuted versus wanting to ask a question. So um, interject at any time, Mark, if, uh, if, you're, if you are uh, struggling to get the, uh, the microphone and not working there. Um, the one, uh, one question that was asked uh, by um, uh, earlier on, just ab about uh, these slides, because they are a wealth of information and uh, whether or not they would be shared with uh, those who are, who are participating today. And yes, they will be uh, posted as part of the replay and each person that registered will get a notice of that once the replay is, is available. So um, I know I'll be referring back to this, this uh, record, the replay and the, uh, and the slides quite a bit myself. Um, and I know that there was also a question in the chat that Linda answered, but just so that everybody makes sure that everybody is aware of it, is, um, is the fact uh, Elizabeth was asking whether the standalone monitor, if there was a size limit uh, for those that are funded by ADP and uh, Linda was kind enough to answer, no, there's no limit for the size. So Lorna, can you correct me if I'm wrong? But my so as far as the, for the extra monitor with the computer, no, there's no size limit. It's really what you can get to fit under that amount. And I think I've been telling people you could try a 27 inch. I think you could squeeze one in, but it might be hard. Um, but that's kind of like my minimum that I would go with because I use a 27 inch, but you know, it's really get the biggest that you need. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to mention, Catherine was talking about the CCTVs. So the individual, the student in this case, would pay $600. But many of these CCTVs are $2,000, $3,000, more than $3,000. They're high-end desktop CCTVs that are excellent tools that have a lot of features. So it's quite a discount. Um, to be able to get that for $600. And a desktop CCTV is the kind of tool that maybe you already got it in grade one or two to read your chapter books, but it will go on forever. They're real workhorses. And if you want to, like nowadays, you might ask Google the number for your pizza, your favorite pizza place. But if you're trying to quickly find something on a piece of paper or you want to read an ad in, in whatever, it's a real quick and dirty way to access information. And also you can write under it. So all the forms you might need to fill out, you know, again, a desktop CCTV is an excellent tool. So um, while I don't think we think about that that much when we think about students and portability, Again, it's a, it's a great tool for someone for their life, whether it's, you know, seeing whether they um, have enough chocolate chips in the cookie dough or whether it's just, you know, checking whether there's um, something stuck on your toothbrush. You can use a CCTV for that. So that's another device that ADP really funds significantly. And I you know, encourage you to consider that when you think of student needs. I think there's a and I would have to through, through our note uh, webinars uh, recently. I, I appreciate uh, you, you uh, continuing that there, Linda, with chocolate chips. Last week it was with milk. Um, so yes. It's, yes. It's, uh, it's a whole new theme for any presenter now has to reference food at least <laughs> once. Um, well, so I remember food. someone who used to check to see if there was mold on the cheese because visually she wouldn't know, but under the CCTV, she could blow it up big enough and see it in color and figure out if that was mold or if that was something else. So very handy. I have to add that the government bulk buys the CCTV, so they get them at a really good rate and they pass on this rate to, to the client. So you won't be able to find a cheaper price CCTV commercially. Yes. Right. They, the vendors or rather the manufacturers really fight to get their CCTVs listed with ADP because essentially it means thousands will be going out. So it's worth it to them to offer this massive discount. And for the client, when you have that reassurance that you've got a five year fully covered warranty, including shipping, that's again, it's very reassuring and you can know that you're well protected for that. 
question on that warranty, uh, Linda. Does the warranty, uh, if there is a, a claim on that, does it go back to an ADP center for a repair or does it go back to the manufacturer? It goes back to CPAC and Waterloo where they have all kinds of expertise in these. And if they can't fix it, they replace it. So again, you're, you're good. And again, these things, at least the ones that were less electronic tend to go on forever. Like they're real workhorses where the, the current, very modern, very digital units how well they're going to last is, is somewhat of an unknown, but certainly the older ones would go 15 years without a problem. I know I've been at my institution for over 10 years. And when I got there, there was a, an old CCTV, uh, old white, um, looks like an old computer monitor with, and it's got green screen print uh, um, on it as well. And it's a, uh, it, it's it, it's an antique, I'm certain, and it's it still is going and going and going. Mm -hmm. um, so I was able to bring in a flat screen television and hook it up to an old Akron Tech. Akron Tech is a vendor that's long gone. Um, when we bought the Scarborough campus had purchased 20, 30 years ago, and this thing would still work very well for white on black, black on white, which is of course what most people read in. So that was kind of a backup unit. When you get too many students needing CCTVs all writing exams at once, you need these backup units so that people can look at that hard copy or fill out hard copy. Exactly. Works. All right, just a final request here. If anybody has any comments or questions to add them into the chat. Mark is still unmuted, so just in case Mark uh, is, is wanting to ask by voice, uh, just a, an opportunity here. And I think it was Lyle I just saw also unmuted. Yeah, um, I got a couple questions if you don't mind. Um, and forgive me, I'm almost 10 minutes delayed in my processing, so I, you might have answered this, but in terms of um, ADP and the bursary, you know, we, I work a lot with the bursary, so I have a better sense around it. And so there are certain limitations to it. So students who are enrolling in BYOD, bring your own device programs, are generally ineligible for a computer through the bursary. Does ADP have a similar mechanism or guideline around students enrolling in school and being limited from accessing the bursary, for, sorry, not the bursary, accessing ADP for a laptop? So that's my first question. If you want to answer them as I go or just ask them all, what, what, what would work better? You could do one at a time. I all think. right. I agree with you, Lerna. Um, I guess th there's no restriction like that. Like I understand that some of the, the schools, it's, it's seen as you need to, it's a basic tool for school. So you need to provide that yourself. And I think that's where ADP kind of fills that in really nicely because ADP is, is providing a laptop because of a visual or physical impairment because it is that basic need. So it's almost like the, the pre-step. You get your ADP funding for your computer system because it is that basic need. It fulfills that very basic criteria. It's a system that you own. It's not owned by the school. Um, and then you can move on and use other funding to kind of add on to that system and really start to customize it to meet your, your other needs. Got it. So if there, and, and there's a limit to what ADP will fund of that device, right? I think it was 70 something or 70% in that neighborhood. Um, can the bursary cover that remaining amount? Did you cover that already? It's kind of tricky. Like we wish they could work together more nicely. Um, there's some creative ways that people have taken, I think, to get around that because what ADP is basically saying is that um, the receipt that ADP sees can't go over that limit. But how you get around that, I'm not suggesting anything, but that receipt that you send into ADP has to be below that limit. So um, for example, I think Catherine kind of touched on that, you know, if you don't need a monitor, if you already have a monitor, you already have a printer, then don't use that amount for that whole system. Use that entire amount for your, your CPU so that you're getting the most out of it. Um, but, and that ADP amount is before taxes as well. But if somebody got their computer, for example, through ADP, then 
they pay for that and the bursary could pick up the 25%, for example. Lorna, are you, like, I think yep. we've done that where somebody used ADP and then the bursary picked up the 25%. So it, there's nothing that forbids that. And then they still have a receipt to submit to the bursary showing that amount was covered for that device. Sorry, 10 minutes delayed, I'll always remember that. So a thousand dollar device, 750 covered by ADP, then you would submit the remaining 250 to the bursary, but how, like as a receipt showing 250 is remaining or like how would that as, go? As a receipt showing I bought this computer and 75% um, was paid by somebody else. Okay, okay, good to know, good to know, okay. Um, third question, last one. Um, the caps, are there caps for ADP and is it published? Like we have guidelines with the bursary that are very clear around the caps. Does this ADP have the same sort of guideline? So yeah, so that slide, I was gonna see if I can go back to it, uh, maybe not, um, but there was a slide um, on there that had the caps. So the okay, laptop I'll... was 1,250, monitor 259, desktop 1,350. Okay, I'll check out the replay. Thank you, thank you for that, sorry about that. Yep. And Lorna, what's the individual authorizer cap on communication aids? I have to double check that. I don't know if anybody here left is a individual authorizer, but I believe it's lower than the clinic. I think so. They're usually lower. Yeah. I think so. No, it's, it's not updated, Victoria, every year. The ADP manual sort of rarely changes on this front, except to maybe add new equipment or alter the equipment that's approved. Um, funding caps are only periodically updated. So it's time that they update the mo external monitor one by the sounds of it. Yeah, no, I know. So. Yes, thanks. Thanks for that question in the chat, Vicki, uh, about the funding caps being updated each year. And uh, there's an additional um, uh, question here from Vicki. Yeah. It's a way for us to, to get. Yeah, go ahead, Linda. Sorry. It is on the website. Actually, the way ADP currently has the website for their devices, it's really bizarre. It sort of makes you as a consumer, it sounds like you just find out where you can go to a vendor and getting the piece of paper. But I believe you can still log into the website as a healthcare professional and access the manuals for communication aids and mobility aids and so on and so forth. So I'm just looking it up. So the maximum that an individual authorizer can authorize for under communication aids is $975. So the clinics, you go through the clinics, you can get a, more funding. Mm -hmm. But if you think about laptop costs, for example, and if ADP pays 75% of the 950. 975. 975, yep. then it's, you know, it's, still feasible, for example, mm -hmm. especially if the bursary picks up so. Mm -hmm. The Mac uh, devices are significantly more money. And so mm -hmm. the cost of those and the opportunity to have them funded is restricted for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's a difference of $50, but since they can't pay the difference, clients have to then opt for a device that isn't maybe the most optimal for them, but it's the one that's funded. So. Lyle's just added in a question in the chat of whether the funding cap document is public. So maybe those links that you're looking up, if if uh, we're allowed to have them, we could include those with the uh, with the um, the replay resources. They are public. It just takes some interpreting. <laughs> Okay. Yep. As with anything to do with the government, um, yep. that's uh, mm -hmm. that's enough said about that. The uh, the uh, I'm not seeing any other. Um, oh, Catherine has just put in the uh, the link into the chat here. So thank you, Catherine. Um, I'll make sure that that gets included with the resources. Um, just a reminder, if there are, as we're wrapping up here, if there are any other questions, uh, to either unmute yourself or to add them into the chat. Um, I did have just, it, it's kind of a comment slash question, and, and I know we've talked about it here today, um, and, and I think Lyle even touched on this, and that is, 
just the, the for everybody here is the, the and for the replay uh, purpose is the, the clarity around the, the BSWD bursary students with disability for the college and, and um, university and private career college uh, se um, segments here in Ontario and then the ADP funding um, we have a clause in the bursary manual as many will probably uh, be aware that requires us to go through other funding sources. Now it does not specifically say ADP must be explored, but it states um, other funding sources. Um, I know that there's a lot of assistive technologists and other um, uh, similar uh, um, uh, people in, in similar positions in institutions that um, choose to ignore that. So in order to make that work um, properly for the student, um, I'm hearing from the three of you that there are potentially major delays, um, major in the grand scheme of things, maybe not, but major to a student who is uh, showing up on everybody's doorstep the, that the, uh, the, the start of class, first day of class kind of thing, and needs this equipment. So how early can a student apply to ADP for whatever ADP is able to help them with so that when they show up on the, on the post-secondary doorstep in September, we can then effectively put in the bursary for whatever else, like right, right out of the gate. What, how, how can we work that so that we're following the rules of the bursary and getting the student not, um, not unwrapping their, their items for Christmas? Well, a lot of it depends on the high school support. And I know a lot of students that are really well supported by their vision itinerant teacher, their special ed teacher, but also the ADP clinics are very aware of where the student is at. And so they're providing the desktop computer to the younger student and the laptop for the student going into high school. And then yes, the new laptop as an option for university college. So the ADP clinics are very aware of the environment and the goals and so on. So they might've already funded that um, or the itinerant teacher might've already got them through the system ahead of time. So for example, the two students that I did the case studies on had both been through ADP just in time to enter university with almost new equipment. But Lorna, what would you say is, or Catherine, that time frame for um, for someone coming to the BTS, for example, or University of Waterloo? How quickly would they get their equipment? So, and keep in mind, ADP funds equipment primarily for personal use, so it doesn't have to relate to their school and, um, you know, devices they're using for school, but um, once they've met with us and had an appointment, going through the ADP process, the funding process, um, it's a two-step process. Once the forms are submitted to ADP, it takes about three to four months for ADP to give them an approval letter and say, okay, you've been approved. So that's a significant wait. And then after that, the vendor will then order the device because if they order in advance and then it's declined, the vendor's out that money. So they often wait until it's been approved. Um, so then after that, it might be another month or so before they either get their device or get their reimbursement. If they're paying, um, if they're deciding to go to a non-registered vendor where they're gonna purchase this device up front, they could purchase that relatively quickly. Like they could go the day after the assessment and go buy their device, but there's that slight risk. If it's declined, then there's no reimbursement um, or, or, and or it's a significant weight for that funds for those funds to be reimbursed. Um, so although they might have the device, if that's a concern financially to wait um, for the reimbursement, they might be waiting until they get that approval letter, which is the three to four months. So the whole process probably takes around six months to kind of go through. Okay. Lorna, anything to add to that? 
I think are like to come in to see an appointment to see us for an appointment. I think you're looking at like about two to three weeks to book an appointment. Um, and then after that, your assessment, like same thing as Catherine said, like you're just waiting for that ADP approval. And I usually suggest to people to wait till they get that approval before they buy their equipment and the vendors are doing the same thing. So it's that, you know, kind of three month wait to get that approval. Um, so I would say if you're looking at getting something for September, you probably want to start planning, you know, now. <laughs> <laughs> that's Yesterday. probably when you want to start thinking about it yep okay so then what i'm hearing from you from the three of you is is that it's it, it is start yesterday and and uh, it's it's uh, going to be a considerable amount of wait time and then the other key piece here for us in the in the post secondary uh, field is that the requirement to check out other funding sources um, as far as ADP's involvement in that clause of the bursary rules is very limited, technically speaking, because the ADP funds only for personal um, at home use. So, no, no, not personal at home. I was emphasizing that with the mobility aid, personal use. So if you in your life are a student, then you're going to use it at home, you're going to use it at school, you're going to take it to the cottage, like this is a non-stop thing. It's just not only for school. Okay, so, so, if, so you're so clear student, that way. If a student wanted a computer for school but had no, no uh, ADP covered reason to use one at home, which would be unlikely, but yeah. Um, if that was the case, then they wouldn't fund it for school. Okay, so yeah. it's not as I, I was. I was thinking it might be clear cut that we could just say that it uh, if it was it's personal use. But you're saying personal covers not just at home; it's at school as well. Okay, so there goes out the window my uh, attempt to simplify it for all of us uh, <laughs> higher ed ATs here. Yeah. Sorry, well, folks. Let me let me try to complicate it more than so, um, I, I, I welcome it, Lyle, because we have the the, the trio of experts here. Yeah, um, <laughs> um, so I think in the beginning, Linda, you said there's no means test to ADP, right? And so it's not taking into and correct me if I'm wrong. It's not taking into consideration the financial well-being or lack thereof of the family, and so that doesn't preclude anyone from purchasing as long as they're within their windows purchasing the devices and technology that they need and that getting and then getting reimbursed afterwards, correct? Unlike OSAP where you must prove one dollar of financial need. No, Am it's not, right? yeah, it's not related to your finances at all. It's just a basic need. You could be making a great income, you're still eligible. It's purely based on your functional ability. So if you um, have a visual impairment, you can come in for an assessment and get funding. You may choose not to. You may also come in for an assessment just to get, you know, some guidance. You don't have to go through ADP funding, but ADP funding is there for you. I mean, I've had clients say to me, well, you know, I really want that iMac 27 inch and ADP won't cover it. So, you know, what? I'm just going to go buy it myself. Thanks for the assessment. I know what I need, um, but I'll go and get it myself. But some people really need that funding and, and it's there for you. So sorry, in that example, when they said that they do have the funding, they would take whatever portion they're granted through ADP, use that, and then cover the rest, or not at all? No, so it has, that's, that's the, the thing about that hard ADP limit, is that the piece of equipment that you're getting, if, you're, if you are using ADP funding, it has to be under that ADP limit. So you can't go out, like right now, you know, the IMAX are just over the, or, or sorry, the MacBook air are just over the, the ADP limit of 1250. So our clients are not able to get that. But once it drops below 1250, then we're like, go ahead. You, that's an option available to you now. You, you can get that. Got it. And so I imagine some people are creative because I know at the bursary side, people are creative and they will mm -hmm. buy and then return, take the money mm -hmm. and then apply it. Yeah. So I can, I, yeah. they can do all those sort of fun things. Okay. That's got it. Thank <laughs> yes. you. Thank you. Just 
just a piece of information that might help and I might uh, anybody on the uh, on the on the session here today can correct me if I'm interpreting this wrong but um, if you're going with educational pricing on the Apple website I the last time I checked I think it was under if I recall you guys told us today it was 1250 for the uh, laptop um, uh, funding cap through ADP and I think it's 11 I want to say 1169 is yeah. the number educational that's, that's true educational pricing it just comes under that adp limit so yeah, if so. they have that available to them then yes then you, yeah. you could get your MacBook. the fact is that apparently if you order online uh, there's apparently no checking if you to see if you are a student or not um okay. that's good to know. my understanding good to know <laughs> yeah uh, don't don't hold me to that when they get when they all of a sudden get randomly audited and asked to provide their student card. But um, anyways, uh, on to the chat here. Kelly has asked, and I, and I think uh, Linda has answered, but I just want to double check and for everybody's benefits uh, as well. The the chat doesn't come through on the replay. Is is uh, Kelly's asking if a student was associated with an AAC clinic? Uh, but may need writing aids for school ergonomic equipment or for school and ergonomic equipment or other accessories uh, what might be covered by ADP versus the BSWD and um, I'll, I'll instead of reading the chat here I'll let the three yeah. of you answer that for Kelly. So I, I had said that ADP would fund a computer system that they would use at home as well as school and the software printer and so on, but they would not be funding specific school software. So your stats software or whatever, and no, they don't fund ergonomic equipment. So they're not gonna fund your, your good orthopedic um, supported um, desk chair and, or an office um, set up this sort of thing, but they do fund the computer. So I, I can add like for community, so visual aids, there's no funding for ergonomic equipment, but for communication aids at the clinic level, you could get the mounting equipment, which could kind of be seen as ergonomic equipment, depending on how you're assessed. So for example, I will, under communication aids clinics, I will get, you know, an, uh, a sit to stand uh, keyboard tray for a client. If that is what's going to position the keyboard so that they are accessing it because of a physical limitation. I'll get like a uh, monitor arm. If for some reason they need to sit in a recline position and that puts things in a better position for them. Um, and then if you're working with somebody that, you know, is seating, you know, in a more complicated position or maybe needs to work from bed or is using some specialized wheelchair, then there's definitely more customized mounting that can be, um, created or put together for the entire system where it's very specific to the, that client's functional abilities and, and their reach ability. So, um, so depending on the situation, there is some funding for what's seen as ergonomic equipment, but not the chairs, like Lena said, and not desks, <laughs> but that's not funded. Okay. All right. And, and uh, great. So, there's no other questions in the chat. Um, and uh, just one last opportunity for those who might uh, be uh, thinking of something to add in there or unmuting themselves uh, to ask by voice as we uh, do, our, do our final wrap up here. Um, and I just wanted to myself to touch on one other thing very quickly is um, there was a couple instances where it was noted that if a person's on social assistance that there was uh, a waiving of some of the fees or a coverage of the entire amount um, the, the, does that apply as well to the 75-25 split? So meaning that ODSP or assistance for children with severe disabilities covers the 25% so that the client doesn't have, for many people, that 25% is an onerous, you know, so True. that's significant and that is accommodated by the other program kicking in. Okay. So really you could have three ministries involved with the support <laughs> of some uh, technology for one student. And by the time the student gets the equipment, they'll have graduated. 
um, with that many government offices involved. The, although we have experts and professionals uh, such as the three of you to help guide us through those kind of uh, um, la um, minefields. Uh, the reason I asked uh, to clarify that was I have a student I've worked with who went to the CNIB and through the ADP uh, funding, or as far as I'm aware, that's the it was the ADP funding that was able to provide a computer for them. Um, and at the same time, uh, they were told that they would have to come up with the 25% and there is a financial, a, a definite financial need in this student's uh, case, although they're not on social assistance. Um, and they apparently uh, filled out some additional forms and had that 25% waived. That's mm -hmm. how it was explained to me. Um, so I'm, is, it's is actually, it, does it get waived or picked up by another something it's, somewhere? It's very easy. You don't actually have to get individual approval. You just provide your ODSP, your proof that you're on ODSP, your, your um, last month's slip or whatever, and the vendor uh, will go ahead and just bill ADP, who then picks it up from the other ministry at some point. So it is easy, Doug. It's one of these amazing easy things. It's a checkbox, actually. It's not yeah. easy. Yeah. Yeah, the rest of our stuff was easy, and I think I can speak for each and every one of those that are here today. <laughs> yeah, it would be nice. Okay, so then that's that's great. I appreciate the clarification on that. So I'm not seeing any other unmuted microphones or questions that have come into the chat. And I know that we have uh, gone over our, our hour, which is totally fine. And I appreciate those uh, staying around uh, as, as participants, as definitely for the three of you uh, to be able to uh, to be able to um, stay around and have this discussion and be able to answer these questions. It's fantastic that you're, you're able to do that. And um, just uh, before, as we as we do our our, our final uh, closing here, I just remind those uh, note members that are with us today is if you'd like to stick around afterwards, um, we will be having a after party for some uh, socialization and discussion. And I certainly invite uh, Linda, Lorna, and Catherine if you'd like to. Uh, not that you're obligated to, but if you'd like to stick around as well, um, uh, by all means, we we'd, we'd love to have you. Um, although I understand some have other obligations that are a little more pressing yeah. than a social hour. <laughs> yep. So, yep. <laughs> um, so on, on that note, um, at, at this point, um, I, just to, to wrap, finally to wrap up here, uh, my brain is swimming with information. Um, Lyle always jokes that he's 10 minutes behind in processing. I think I'm an hour and 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> the replay is going to be invaluable in this kind of, in this particular case without mention the resources, that the links um, and such, uh, the slides, absolutely. But uh, I know for myself and I want to just, I think I reiterate for everybody's benefit is that uh, when it comes to this kind of, um, these kind of situations and these kind of funding formulas and specialized equipment, us as assistive technologists, if that's the only hat that we wear, I don't honestly think that we should be making these decisions in isolation. I think we need to consult with the experts we have three of them here as examples, perfect um, examples of experts that are in the field. And there's many more uh, spread out through the province and uh, even outside of Ontario, I'm certain there's equivalent uh, people. So uh, to reach out to our note colleagues, uh, Linda, Lorna and Catherine, as well as uh, if they aren't able to help, I'm certain that they would know somebody who will be able to and uh, consult with the experts. Uh, don't make these decisions in isolation because there's a lot of different aspects to consider. So um, that's what I'm taking away from this, uh, um, short of uh, finding the line for the, uh, for the reconditioned um, used uh, CCTVs. Um, that was excellent information to share. And again, uh, the, the lineup starts where for those? Uh, your local CNIB. So if you're looking for a surplus, contact your local CNIB. Um, for some more information and for an assessment to make sure that you're getting the right one for you. But Catherine, what about a library, for example? Mm -hmm. Still local CNIB. Um, if they're not helpful, please reach out to me and I can put you in touch with Dave, but generally it's the, the CNIB there. Just because you want to um, make sure that you're Still, even if it is for a library, you might want to compare the different models 
or talk about different options to make sure that you think it's going to best serve your population um, versus picking one blindly because there's not a return policy for that. So, so it's a final sale. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So uh, again, I appreciate that, uh, that tidbit of information as well. So I wanted to bring that up and just to restate it. So people are aware of that. Um, just, as assistive technologists, as I always say, we're, we're always looking to fill our toolboxes and now um, they're even more overflowing than they were last week. Um, it's, it's incredible the amount of information we're taking away from this today and I wanna thank each of the three of you. Um, was there any final uh, um, remarks that either of the, any of the three of you want to add into this session before we do close off? No, just thanks for having us and uh, including us in um, your resources. Yeah. And just um, Doug has set up Balance as an organization that's going to be presenting in July. So that's another resource that you can learn more about in July. And yeah, we really value what Note offers and all of Doug's efforts. And we're grateful to be able to come on and to give this plug and also just to say, hey, there's a lot of stuff out there and this is how you can support your students with it. So thanks for the opportunity. Perfect. And any final thoughts, Catherine? No, thank you so much. Well, thank you again to the three of you, your continued support of the, of the profession, the assistive technology profession in our community, as well as the network of assistive technologists. Uh, we're so grateful for it. And I look forward to keeping, uh, for you guys keeping the AT community up to date, share any information that you might have in the future, please pass it along and, uh, and definitely stay in touch both as note members, uh, as well as, the, uh, as, as presenters, if there's any information you'd like to share in the future. I know that we're always, uh, as, as each of you, we're always hungry for that information and, uh, and welcome you anytime. So, um, so. Just a reminder uh, that uh, everyone here today, I, I wanna thank you all for joining us. And just remember, you can't spell education without AT.